Hello and welcome, Livingston Public Library patrons. My name is Hilary May. I'm from the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts. We are located in Madison. I'm sorry that I can't be doing this program in person with all of you in your beautiful library or hosting you at our museum even right now, but I'm glad that we can still connect in some way. Before we turn to our topic of the day, I am just gonna talk briefly about our museum. So this is what our building looks like from the outside. You've probably driven past it if you've ever driven through Madison, maybe not giving it any thought at all or thinking it was a church there, one of the many churches. And this impression of it looking like a church would have been reinforced if you go inside. Um, it has stained glass windows, vaulted arch ceilings, hand stenciled walls, and a cruciform floor plan, meaning it's laid out in the shape of a cross, like many churches are. But this building was never a church. It was built in 1899 as Madison's first public library. A man called D. Willis James gave the money to the town of Madison so that they could have a, this beautiful library. And it was intentionally designed to look like a church. The technical term for the style of architecture is Richardsonian Romanesque Revival Architecture. But it is a beautiful building that we are lucky enough to have as our museum building today. Just to give you a bit of an idea of what the library looked like from the inside, this picture here shows what was known as the main reading room. In the early days at the library, you weren't allowed to just browse the shelves, something I know we all love doing in libraries today. Instead, you would go to the librarian, whose desk is sort of toward the back of this picture here, tell them what book you wanted, and they would get it from the book stacks, which you can just barely see the edge of at the very back of this picture. If you see something that looks a little like a balcony, there were bookshelves all up and down on both sides of that section back there. So they would bring your book to the reading room. That's where you would read it. And those lights are electric. This building did have electricity from 1899 when it was built, so it was fairly modern for the time. Another innovation about this building was that it had in the lower level a periodicals room. Now, Madison was a growing town at this time and had a lot of immigrants coming in. So they ordered in newspapers and magazines in many different languages, and those were on that lower level. And even when the main library closed, that reading area for the periodicals remained open much later so that working men and women could come and read newspapers in their own language when they got off of work. So the library remained in the building until the mid 1960s when it became too small for to be a library for this growing town and the library moved to what is its current location elsewhere in Madison. And a couple in town, Edgar and Agnes Land, asked the town of Madison if they could um, use this building for their growing collection of 18th and 19th century tools and other artifacts. Fortunately, the town of Madison said yes, and the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts was born in 1969. So this picture shows you uh, what it looks like today. It's from sort of the opposite angle of that previous image. We're now looking toward that, what was the me main reading room, into what's now a gallery where we have changing exhibits. We change them out about twice a year. And this does give you a, a better sense of all the decorative and architectural elements as well, although a picture can never quite do it justice. And all of those architectural features, decorative elements, and so on are original to the building. And we are listed on both the state and national his registry of historic buildings. So although many things have changed about uh, the museum over the last 50 years, we are still dedicated to telling the stories of ordinary people from um, 18th and 19th century New Jersey. And we also do a wide range of other things like this program here, exploring various historical based topics. So turning now to the topic of the program today, the dog days of summer. And those dog days of summer are approaching quickly, but why do we call them that? So this program is going to explore the origin of some of the unusual phrases, expressions, idioms that we use all the time without any thought, but which don't make a whole lot of sense if you really take a closer look at them or if English is not your first language. So a couple overarching things to start. Um, some of these have a very old origin. They've been around for thousands of years. Some are much more recent. Some have a fairly well-known origin of where they came from. Others, it's more speculation. 
And for all of them, they've modified over time. Language is an organic thing. It's never fixed. So all of these expressions have developed and changed based on society and culture. Um, and, and so their meaning has changed and will continue to change. None of them are ever quite fixed. All right, the dog days of summer. Um, this is a, a phrase we use to refer to kind of the hottest part of the summer. Um, and the Ari, the dog of our curator of collections and exhibits, is kindly here demonstrating what a dog might do in the summer, maybe not wanting to move a whole lot. And it does seem like the origin of this phrase should be related to dogs, right? Something about how dogs behave in summer. But in fact, it does not. This phrase actually has nothing to do with dogs at all. So this period, we do tend to think of the dog days of summer as being from about July 3rd to August 11th. And this is the period when the dog star Sirius rises close to the same time as the sun. And for ancient Greeks and Egyptians, this was a time that they strongly associated with disease and disaster. Um, and the dog star also, going back to the Iliad, has strong associations with, with bad things happening, war, disease, and all of that. And even if some of that comes from superstition, there is some, um, perhaps, realism mixed in there. Many diseases, especially some of the ones that were rampant historically, are worse in the summer. They're exacerbated by that heat. Um, also, a lot of storms occur in the summer, right? You think about hurricane season. And people do just tend to be crazy or maybe sometimes behaving in strange ways when it is so hot. So maybe some realism associated with those superstitions. But of course, the dog star does not have anything to do with the weather itself. Now, this phrase was translated into English about 500 years ago. And because people didn't really understand the origins, it did start to take on connotations more connected with dogs and dogs being crazy in the summer or something like that. But that was certainly not the original origin of this phrasing. Um, another thing to um, note regarding the dog star is that the, the period during which the dog star and the sun rise at close to the same time depends where you are on Earth and also changes over time. So it's changed a little bit from the ancient Greek time to today and will continue to do so. So in the future, thousands of years from now, it will actually be the dog days of winter. So mad as a hatter. This is a phrase we use to describe someone who's a bit crazy, maybe even really crazy, acting erratically, um, just behaving very strangely perhaps. Not maybe our phrase we use all the time, but one we mostly recognize, and probably its strongest association is with the Mad Hatter in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. It's certainly something many of us think of. And I will note that this uh, hat and this image here, along with other objects you'll see throughout this, are from the collection of the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts, um, giving a little bit of a historical context as we discuss the origins of these um, various phrases. So Lewis Carroll certainly popularized this phrase in his 1865 Alice in Wonderland, but he definitely did not invent it. Um, the origin is not known for sure, but one of the most likely origins has to do with um, hatters using mercury and making hats like the one in this picture. And mercury poisoning symptoms include mood swings, aggressiveness, trembling, things that can make someone seem a bit crazy. And people didn't understand the link to mercury. That cause and effect was not well understood. Um, but there was some realization that hatters were associated with some of these symptoms. Um, there was something called hatter's shakes, sort of an, a nerve disease that was um, you know, seen in hatters and kind of had similar to Parkinson's type symptoms. So that link was you know, established without this phrase, and this phrase, Mad as a Hatter, does appear in print as early as 1819. Another possible origin for this phrase is that maybe it used to be mad as an adder, A-D-D-E-R, the snake. So maybe similar to the phrase, mad as a cut snake. Doesn't seem as plausible or as fun, but is another possible origin for this phrase. All right, a wild goose chase. 
So we, we use this to refer to something where it's sort of an endeavor that maybe is doomed to fail or it really has very little chance of success. So it's going after something like that. Um, but this actually does have a literal origin. There was a type of horse race in the 16th century where riders would follow the lead rider on a course that was uh, sort of unpredictable, maybe a little erratic, certainly not what you would expect for a horse race. And people watching it were reminded of how geese fly. And they kind of seem to be following a leader, maybe in a somewhat random type of path. And this phrase was used by Shakespeare in his uh, in Romeo and Juliet. So it was well known by that point and probably solidified in our language because of him. So in uh, Romeo and Juliet, Mercutio says to Romeo, Nay, if our wits run the wild goose chase, I am done. For thou hast more of the wild goose chase in one of thy wits than I, I am sure, have in my whole five. So popularized there. And this is um, another example, we saw that first with the Mad Hatter, of literature taking a phrase that maybe existed, but spreading it more broadly. Also, sometimes when there might be multiple meanings for a phrase, that literary usage might solidify it in a particular way, a particular usage as it spreads. Bury the hatchet. So this is a phrase that we might use when maybe we've been having an argument with someone, maybe you're even estranged from them, but you're deciding to put aside your differences, come together, bury the hatchet and you know, be friends again, put aside that argument. This phrase does have a very literal origin. Um, so some Native Americans, especially those among the Iroquois, had a practice where they would literally bury their hatchets or other weapons if they came to peace talks. The theory being, how can you discuss peace if you're all armed to the teeth? It makes a lot of sense. And this practice was recorded by early European settlers as, as early as 1680, but the evidence suggests that this long predated the Europeans. They were simply the first ones to sort of write this down and, and document it in that sense. But this is certainly an example of a literal practice, a literal thing that people did, taking on a figurative but very similar meaning. All right, to drone on. So if you go to a really boring talk or you're in a boring meeting and someone's going on and on, maybe their voice is really in a monotone, no change in the inflection, we'd say that they drone on. And as you may have picked up, from the picture on this slide, this does have to do with bees. So this picture is of a, a New Jersey apiary or beekeeper. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the historic practice of beekeeping in a minute. But first, turning to those bees, those drones, the drone is the name for the male bee. And they do not um, pollinate flowers. They don't do any of the functions that the other workers do. Their only purpose is to mate with the queen. That's the only reason that male bees exist. But they do also make that sustained buzzing noise that maybe sounds a little bit like someone going on and on and on in a monotone. So that's where that comes from. We also, of course, now have a new type of drone um, and you know, the name given to our flying automated crafts that we have today, a similar type of thing. So that um, type of beehive that we saw in that other picture and a small version of it here with those frames that the beekeeper pulls out to take the honeycomb off and all of that is a relatively new thing. So prior to the 1850s, beekeepers uh, raised bees in something more similar to their natural way of making a beehive, something called a skep, it's sort of a cone-shaped thing. There's really no good way to get the honey as a honeycomb out of it without destroying the hive and often the bees as well. So not the most efficient way to, to raise bees if you have to literally destroy your hive and the bees every time you want honey. So the invention in the 1850s of these removable trays that you could pull out, take off the honeycomb, um, you know, put it back in without in any way disturbing or hurting the bees was hugely revolutionary and really changed um, the activity of beekeeping and honey making and has remained pretty much unchanged for the last 150 years in terms of how we make honey. 
clue. Not a phrase, but certainly a word that we use a lot, um, whether it's in a crime drama where there's clues, there's evidence all over the place. I mean, you think Sherlock Holmes is searching for clues. You know, we have the reverse, we have being clueless. So a very common word in our language, but its origins are a little bit more obscure. They aren't sort of readily obvious. And it actually has a very old ancient origin. So in Greek mythology, Theseus goes into the labyrinth um, and he's fighting the, the Minotaur. If you are familiar with Greek mythology, this is the half man, half bull that he does eventually defeat. But this is a labyrinth that most people are never able to find their way out of. And so he uses a ball of yarn or string to unravel behind him um, to then be able to find his way out again. Now, once this tale gets translated, the Germanic word for this ball of yarn is clue, C-L-E-W. So this is a translation for this clue, this piece of evidence that Theseus used to get himself out of the labyrinth. It continues to uh, modify in, in sort of Middle English. You have C-L-E-W-E -E, and then C-L-E-U-E -E, and eventually our C-L-U-E -E spelling that we use today, but all deriving from that word for a ball of yarn. And originally, as it starts to mean um, you know, more than just this reference from Theseus, from Greek mythology, it's originally sort of directional evidence. So again, more closely relating to that, so a clue to send you in the right direction, and then eventually takes on its much broader meaning that we have today. Cold shoulder. So if I am treating someone badly, maybe ignoring them, snubbing them, something like that, it's said that I give them the cold shoulder. So there's a popular origin given for this story uh, to do with giving an unfavored guest sort of a cold shoulder of meat, a less favored cut of meat. But that probably is not the origin. There's not really any evidence that that is actually the origin of this particular phrase. It first appears in 1860 in a Walter Scott book in his Antiquary, and he does use it kind of the way we do today, is this expression of disdain or dislike. Um, and it seems most likely that he really invented this phrase or, or maybe popularized what was an uncommon existing phrase, but it then starts to appear much more often. You see it in Charles Dickens. It even appears in a New England newspaper by the 1840s. So whether or not he actually invented it or took a very uncommon phrase, certainly he is responsible for spreading it. And again, sort of as we talked about before, for spreading it with that particular usage. It's um, his use of it as this expression of disdain in his book that solidifies that particular meaning within the English language. Curiosity killed the cat. And look at those two wonderful, clearly very curious cats. We use this to kind of express the idea that being too nosy or curious could be bad for you and, and cause problems. But the phrase was originally care killed the cat. Um, so care meaning um, worry or sorrow for others. So a little bit broader meaning, a little bit different interpretation of that. Um, but, you know, used in generally the same sort of way, it first appears in a 1598 Ben Johnson play. It's not clear, you know, whether he invented it or if it had existed, you know, sort of popularly before that, but that is the first time it seems to appear in print. And in fact, this play was first performed by William Shakespeare. And Shakespeare then went on to use it the next year in 1599 in Much Ado About Nothing. So again, the literature kind of popularizing, if not inventing, this term. So it stays in this phrasing, care killed the cat, for quite a while. An 1898 uh, dictionary of phrases and fables has it like that. So it's not clear exactly when it starts to be curiosity or when that change starts to occur. But there, um, there is an Irish newspaper in 1868 using curiosity killed the cat also listed in 1873 as an Irish proverb that way. So maybe around you know, the second half of the 19th century, maybe in Ireland, the phrasing starts to change. 
And then by the early 1900s, it was pretty solidly and commonly curiosity killed the cat, the phrase that we're familiar with today. And even if it's not the everyday phrase we use, we uh, certainly all recognize what it means when we see it. Caught red-handed. Um, another fun one, you can see another uh, object from our collection, some handcuffs there. And we use this when someone's, you know, caught in the act. It could be very benign, right? You're stealing cookies from the cookie jar, you get caught at it, you're caught red-handed, you know, seen doing whatever it is that you're accused of. And this one actually has a legal origin. So literal also but coming from someone caught doing something that would result in them having blood on their hands. Murder or poaching, which is a serious crime historically. So this first appears in 1432 in the Scottish Acts of Parliament, and it's often found in Scottish leading legal proceedings. So it was very much a legal term um, that was being used to, to express this concept, um, a piece of evidence in a sense. So it um, kind of makes its way out of that legal terminology with Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe in 1839. So he certainly did not invent the term, but he took it from being this legal terminology to something used more broadly and spreading throughout society. And eventually from there, it comes to refer to being caught committing any crime or bad thing, not just something violent where you would literally have blood or red on your hands. It also was originally caught red hand. Um, the red hand did also comes with Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe. Jaywalker. So you probably don't even think about this as being an unusual expression. Um, you know, when we cross the street illegally or someone we're not supposed to, we call it jaywalking. Um, not something we, we think too much about, but it is a little bit of an odd expression. Doesn't necessarily make sense. There's some popular uh, myth that says it comes from the sort of path of crossing the street illegally is similar to a jay or maybe similar to the path of a jaybird. But in fact, neither of those is correct. The word jay by around 1900 was an insult. Um, something kind of similar to how we might use the word hick today. Someone who is unsophisticated, unfamiliar with city life, Maybe not that smart, um, you know, definitely a kind of a country bumpkin almost type of a thing. And this is, a, this is at a time when cities are starting to grow. So, you know, this is um, at the end of the 19th century. No longer are most people living on farms in country rural existences. Cities are really becoming much more populous and much more common. So from this insult, J. You get a J driver, someone who drives their carriage or eventually car on the wrong side of the road. So maybe they're not familiar with urban life and needing to stay on one side of the road. They're used to driving on country roads. And then jaywalker develops similarly. Someone with sort of bad sidewalk etiquette, maybe walking on the wrong side, not really knowing how to behave on a crowded sidewalk. And sort of relating again back to that idea of the J being somewhat unfamiliar with city life, that would also translate into not knowing where to cross the street. If you're not familiar with a city, you would know that there were certain places to cross. And so it develops into that usage from there. So the phrase J driver first appears in print in Kansas in 1905. Um, and then sort of jaywalker from there. And then by 1937, the usage of how we use it today was pretty commonly understood. So this is definitely a phrase that evolves and develops fairly quickly in sort of the first couple decades of the 20th century. Devil's advocate. So we use this for when we take a position contrary to maybe what we believe or to bring up an alternative point. You know, I'm just going to be the devil's advocate and, and bring up this point here, right? Um, and the origin of this doesn't have anything to do with our wonderful devil shown here. It was, in fact, and really still is, an official position in the Catholic Church. The job of the devil's advocate, um, whose official title was promoter of the faith, was to argue against a candidate for sainthood. The idea being that if someone was up for being a saint or canonization, that they should be thoroughly vetted and examined. 
So the, the devil's advocate argued against all their qualifications, against all their miracles, so that these could be responded to adequately and make sure that this person truly was worthy of sainthood. Um, so it, that was its original usage. By 1760, it's already sort of taking on its more modern use of being contrary for the sake of it or, or to bring up alternative viewpoints beyond that one very specific usage that the position of the devil's advocate entails. Break the ice. Um, so this is a phrase that's used very common, you know, commonly today. I mean, anytime you have a, a new job, a new group of people, anything like that, there'll be an icebreaker, right, to relieve the tension, help you get to know each other, things like that. Um, so before we get to the origin of this phrase, I will just talk briefly about this tool. It doesn't look very familiar to us today, but anyone who lived prior to refrigeration would recognize this tool. These are ice tongs used for lifting blocks of ice that were used to keep your food cool. So ice was a vital way of uh, offering some kind of cooling for your food. Obviously nothing like what modern refrigeration offers, but this would have been definitely a tool either on a very large scale for the people who were harvesting ice out of a lake or on a household level for lifting your block of ice that would be delivered into your ice box or wherever you were keeping it. So this is a phrase that really always had a more figurative meaning than, than literal. Um, so it starts out in the 1570s kind of meaning paving the way for something, getting ready for some kind of venture or endeavor. You can think about that coming from the idea that if you were to break the ice through something that would help the endeavor get started, but really always as a figurative expression starts to develop um, over time by the 17th century. It's starting to mean sort of alleviating an awkward social atmosphere. And then by the end of the 19th century, and seems to coincide with when you start to have icebreaker ships, so ships that are literally breaking the ice, something that did not exist before, it starts to become, you know, activities that help strangers get to know each other. And this usage is popularized, spread, and, and probably solidified by Mark Twain. He uses this phrase in his 1883 Life on the Mississippi, um, this idea of an icebreaker helping strangers get to know each other. So another literary example where um, he took what was probably the common usage at the time, but really solidified that particular meaning going forward. Quarantine. So this one's pretty close to home for us today, this word. Um, certainly many of us are experiencing quarantine or have over the past couple months here. But the concept of um, diseases that, that people need to be quarantined from to protect themselves and others is certainly nothing new. Um, one of the worst outbreaks of disease was the, the Black Death and the plague that started in you know, sort of the 14th century Europe and really devastated a huge swath of Europe and other parts of the world. And they didn't understand germs the way that we do, but they did understand that being close to a sick person could get you sick. So this idea of isolating sick people certainly did exist. And a port city like Venice um, was particularly concerned because they had people coming in from all over the world. Not good for the spread of disease, so they would require ships to sit at anchor for 40 days. A somewhat arbitrary uh, length of time, um, but the Italian word for 40, quaranta, does give us the word quarantine, and that word stuck even when the period of quarantining was different um, and changed over time in different places, that, that quarantine word from that 40 days stuck nonetheless. Eating humble pie. Um, this is a phrase we use if someone has to apologize for something they did, maybe make a confession. And usually we mean it publicly, like they have to stand up in front of people and admit to doing something wrong, something that they don't really want to admit. It's usually a pretty embarrassing, humiliating experience for them. And it would seem like the origin of this phrase comes from that word humble, right? You have to be fairly humble to stand up and admit your offense, admit your wrongdoing. But that's actually not where the phrase comes from. So in the 14th and 15th century, umbles or numbles 
were um, parts of the animal that we tend to call awful today, O-F-F-A-L. The entrails and other parts that we usually do not eat today. However, in the 14th and 15th century, they were eaten. There was much more of a sense of, of eating all parts of the animals, particularly for those who were poorer and couldn't afford anything else. But it was certainly not parts of the animal that would be eaten by those of higher status. So if a high status person were fed humble pie, this would be very embarrassing and humiliating. This is a time when class and status were extremely important, and so were the symbols of that status. So to be seen eating something that designated you of lower status or to be given such a thing was extremely humiliating and an insult to you. It's less clear exactly how it became eating humble pie. Um, it could be because of the similarity in sounding, you know, humble and humble are quite similar. Or maybe kind of going back to what we said at the beginning that you do have to be humble in order to do something like this. But that is where the ultimate origin of this phrase is. On the wagon. So we're probably more likely to use the reverse, the off the wagon, someone who has relapsed to some kind of addiction, something like that. But the origin of this phrase does also relate to, it's not addiction, at least to alcohol. Um, so there was a big temperance movement in the 19th century. These were movements trying to eliminate or at least greatly reduce the consumption of alcohol. These movements were quite powerful um, and, and popular, and they did eventually lead to the passing of the 18th Amendment, what we call Prohibition, which uh, did outlaw the sale of alcohol um, from 1920 to 1933. The law before that happened, there was a phrase that men would use who were abstaining from alcohol. They would say they were on the water wagon. And what they were referring to for this was a wagon with water in it that went around spraying water on the roads to keep down the dust. Picture dirt roads and how much dust comes up. Clearly, you know, not, not ideal to have that, particularly when you're in an open carriage, of course, no, very few enclosed compartments. So this was a thing that would go around. But the water it used was not what we would call potable, not meant to be drunk, so not taste very good. So what these men meant by this phrase of being on the water wagon is that they would rather drink that gross water from the water wagon or water cart than drink alcohol. So eventually the meaning sort of changes and starts to apply to other types of addiction as well. And then the reverse meaning also develops the way we more likely use it today of off the wagon. But this is where it originally comes from. Until the cows come home. So we use this to mean something that takes a really long time or maybe someone's going to be out until the cows come home, meaning out all night or something. Um, but this one has a, not a super certain origin, does first appear in print in the 17th or 18th century. Um, and this is certainly relating to the idea that most people throughout much of human history were farmers of some kind. Agricultural connections are very common in the phrases we use in our language because that's the association that people would have had. Um, so this is certainly relying on that sort of familiarity with cows and their behavior that most of us don't have today. So there's several possible origins that people consider for this. Maybe just that cows take a long time to do anything. Also, cows might be out at pasture, only come back when they want to be milked. Sometimes cows stay out at pasture for months at a time, all summer long. They only come back, you know, in the winter time when they need to go inside. Certainly, it relates to the idea that cows never do anything quickly. So a note on the object from our collection here, that's a butter mold. Not something we particularly use today. You can see the bottom picture has sort of the handle, the top part. And then on the other side, there's this beautiful carving of a cow. So when you made your butter, you would press this in and get that nice pattern in your butter. Why? Well, on the one hand, it would just make it look nice. It was a really decorative element to it. And uh, notice how ornately carved it is. So it's really showing the skill of the person who made it as much of the, as the butter then who that displays it. But it also had a more practical purpose. 
Women often made extra butter to take to market to sell or trade. This could be a really important part of their family economy, bringing in some extra income for the, the family and the farm. And they would want to identify their butter distinct from other people's butter. So these um, butter molds served as sort of a, an early and very local brand or logo, the kind of thing any company today has. And we have many of these in our collection. They were clearly very common, very varied, and most of them really displaying a high level of skill in the maker, uh, much more than would be necessary for its strictly functional use. <clears throat> Let your hair down. So we use this if someone's maybe going to be a bit wild, um, behave in a way that's maybe not totally considered appropriate, certainly that might be unusual for them, unexpected for them. And uh, just to note the objects here, the hair comb has fallen out of fashion uh, recently, but certainly existed long after the 19th century. And, but the hand mirror doesn't look all that different from a, from a hand mirror or compact that might be used today. So this phrase dates to probably the 17th century at a time when women really were expected in public to have their hair neatly pinned up. They were really only supposed to have their hair down when they were home in the company of their family. It was inappropriate for them to have their hair down otherwise. And this concept of, of women's hair needing to be covered or up and neat is certainly one that's found in, in a lot of cultures uh, around the world now and in the present. Um, so this idea of women's hair being covered for modesty is, is uh, one that's found in a lot of different places. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed learning about the origins of some of the strange expressions, phrases, idioms, and other things that we say all the time without giving them much thought. And we do hope to be able to see you in person before too long. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is on the screen there. I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, and in the meantime, please stay safe and stay well.